Welcome. I am calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, June, July 18, 2022. I am Select Board Chair Leonard Diggins, and I will now confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are here and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. John Hurd? Yes. Steve DeCourcy? Yes. Eric Helmuth? Yes. And Madam Vice Chair Mahan will not be with us tonight. Steph, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sandy Pooler? Here. Doug Heim? Here. Ashley Meyer. Here. Great, thank you. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a, in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022 signed into law on July 17, 2022, which further extends the cer certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation. The Act includes an extension until March 23, 2023 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's original March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is on the town's website and referenced with the general materials for this meeting, allow public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as there is reasonable access that allows the public to follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment, and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI may follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Monova's agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken via roll call. So I would like to start with the second item on the agenda, which is the land acknowledgement. And I'd like to read the land acknowledgement that the select board supported last spring and town meeting approved through the resolution, which is also contained on the town's website. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous people from whom, from whom the colony, province, and the commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts tribe territories today. I will now turn to item three on the agenda. And it's for approval. The Summer Soul Celebration on Thursday, August 4th, 2022 at the Regent Theater. And we have David Thomas. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Hello, Hello everyone. How you doing? Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Great. So you want to tell us a bit about the Soul Celebration? Yes. The uh, Celebration is a, a group of musicians, uh, such as Tony Wilson, James Brown Jr., my band, uh, Sun's Rain, and uh, several uh, longtime musicians that we used to play with Little Joe Cook at the Cantab Lounge uh, in Cambridge for many years. And uh, been working with the Regent Theater for a bit to do a, a benefit, and this is to, uh, uh, to raise funds for Boston Children's Hospital, uh, Mount Auburn Hospital, Yes, a PCA and a couple of veterans groups. And we've also reached out to Arlington Eats. We thought it would be a good thing to have uh, several food trucks that have uh, agreed to also donate to the charities uh, with a portion of their proceeds. And we think that it's gonna be a great event. Uh, uh, several of the musicians have already played at the Legion Theater and they've been very welcoming. And we, we think it'll bring people together uh, from all walks of life and, and um, be for a good cause to, to donate to those charities and bring friends and family together after this, this long 
difficult time with COVID and people being apart. Well, thank you very much. It sounds like a good event. I'll turn to my colleagues, Mr. Hurd. Well, first I'd like to move approval. And then second, um, I'm not sure if I missed this, but I'm not 100% sure what's being asked of us. Um, I see it says some parking spaces, but we don't have a plan. Do we know which parking spaces we're talking about? Because there's a bus stop there, there's taxi stands there. Um, yeah, I, yes, I yes, assume, sir. And I assume yeah, traffic I, I, will still go through. Yes, sir. I was uh, working with uh, Ashley and uh, and that uh, actually uh, the manager for the town select board and i i got her some photos late this afternoon about the request for the for the parking that and they would be five spots beyond the bus stop uh, heading down towards uh, heading down towards the uh, the little gymnasium there so yep. there's the bus stop and then there's a few and i, I sent pictures uh, to Ashley, but I, as I said, I didn't get it to, to her till late, so we were looking at five parking spots, and if we needed to have a police detail or a traffic detail there uh, to you know, keep things moving, uh, we have no problem. Uh, you know, we'd love to have, we'd have to love to have that. And uh, since we think there'll be a lot of families there coming for the food trucks and kids, that it's, Good to make sure everything is safe and secure and that uh, there's, there's good traffic flow and people are aware of pedestrians you know, going to and fro uh, getting the food and, uh, and i hope you'll all uh, if, if approved i hope you'll all come down and join us yep. all right and i think that clarifies so it's the five parking spots beyond the mbta bus stop on the regent side of medford street and it will be yes, good, sir. and it's in the application, I think all my colleagues will agree that it will be good to have a, a detail there because there is some open outdoor seating across the street where if there's a food truck, I assume a lot of people will, will go and eat across the street. So it would be good to have a detail there. So I think that should definitely be part of, of the event. Other than that, sounds awesome. I'd love to come by. I'll look forward to it. I'll put it on my calendar. I think it will be really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'll second Mr. Hurd's motion and, and just reiterate that um, I know you, you've said that you um, will have a police detail. I think I think just I don't know how much coordination there has been with the police department to date. Um, I spoke with Corey over at the police department. Okay, all right. So so it, it sounds like we're covered there. So I'm happy to support this. Um, we wish you well on it and and um just whatever coordination is needed ahead of time i just encourage you to work through our office and work through the police department on that yes sir thank you Ms. Um, thank you um yeah thank you Ms. Barr. um uh, just a question for our town manager do you have any concerns about the plan as as uh, detailed out uh, this evening um no, uh, in that uh, it seems like the layout. It wasn't clear whether the musicians are going to be playing in the theater. In and, the theater, yes, in the theater. Um, I was going to check in tomorrow with our health director about what she thinks about the COVID exposure for an event like this. Mm -hmm. um, and well, I can report back because that would be my main concern. Thank you. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that's a separate, you know, that can be a separate consideration from, from the uh, parking spaces that we're going to be authorizing tonight. Um, and a question for my colleagues who've made and seconded the motion, which I certainly support. Do you intend that the police detail would be a condition of that motion? Yes. Thank you for that clarification. Well, I'm happy to support it. I mean, the, the music, I'm sure, will be great. The food trucks look very interesting. So. So let's hope we can get that that parking in, and and, and so I'm um, on a motion by Mr. Hurd, you know, with the contingency mean of um, the police detail, and a second by Mr. Corsi, Mr. Heim, Mr. Hurd, yes, Mr. Corsi, yes, Mr. Hellman, yes, Mr. Diggins, yes. It's a four-zero vote. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Thomas, and hope thank you so much. Good luck. Looking Good luck. forward to meeting you all. And so, having you at the event. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Thank you. So moving on.
to this consent agenda. We have the minutes for uh, the June 13th, 2022 meeting and the June 27th, 2022 meeting. And we have reappointments, all terms to expire on uh, June 30th, 2025. Conservation Commission, David Kaplan, Charles Tyrone, Library Board of Trustees, Stephen Quinlan, Open Space Committee, Brian Calder, Wendy Richter, Park and Recreation Committee, Phil Lasker. And number six, we have a request for a contractor drain layer license, Paul J. Rose Excavating, Inco Excavating Incorporated. Um, so with that, Mr. DeCourcy. Move approval. Second. Okay. All set here. So on a motion by Mr. DeCourcy and a second by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mr. Jiggins. Yes. Uh, four zero vote. Thank you. Moving on to our first of three public hearings on street betterment. Now, the first one is Reed Street Betterment. Uh, and I guess we have with us Katina Leotis. Tina? Hello. Hi. You know, if um, you tell me how you want to be addressed, I'll be happy to address you that way, Mr. Ms. Mrs. First name is fine, but I, I'm not familiar with the process. I just was invited to be visible, but I'm just here about the um, the repaving of Reed and Fesda streets. Great. And so, Mr. Heim, you know, do you want to guide us a little bit through this process? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in short, the board can examine the application. If the proponents, uh, the abutters who live on these streets wish to say anything about why they believe they should qualify for a betterment, the board can then ask any questions about any concerns that the board has. And if any member of the public would like to express either any reservation about the betterment generally or an abutter uh, opposes the betterment process, the board can hear from them after the board has an opportunity to ask questions to the uh, proponent. Well, thank you. Because I, mean, I read all the materials I mean, and I didn't see any description I mean, of what's going to be done on any of the three. So that's why when I, mean, I turned to you, um, Katina, I was, I was expecting maybe a little explanation. Of what's going no, to no, I, I, I'm no engineer. I'm, I'm a resident and a homeowner on the street who feels very strongly that the street should be repaved. It's filled with potholes. It's uh, very difficult to drive down. Um, numerous uh, uh, people who've come down the street have had their vehicles damaged. Um, and um, but I'm no engineer. I don't know what the. I know that the contractor did put forward a pretty detailed. But I should really defer to John Jesus, my neighbor, who has been much more involved in sort of tracking the details of the project. Yeah, I, I can comment. Hold on a second. So, just to hurt. Well, I just said generally when we have the betterment hearings. We rely. I, the contractors have to work with the town engineering department, inspectional services. So that's our experts that, so they come to us for authorization to go through the process whereby they work with them to make sure that the roads are done properly. Okay. Right, so I'm not sure what the, what the requirements are for this meeting and what you exactly, what you want. I just assume that that was all done. The, the contractor was selected. We went through the process. You know, it was a two year process. We met with, uh, uh, early on with engineering, they, they suggested that we go through the betterment process because it is uh, a large amount of, of abutters on both streets. Um, so we followed that betterment process. We got multiple bids. Uh, we selected the cheapest from a reputable, uh, reputable contractor uh, who provided the details to the town. All those bids were submitted to the town. Um, <clears throat> the price uh, was broken out by street. Because uh, they had to be, it had to be separated. We couldn't do a combined Reed Street, Bethesda Street. So the, originally, the ballot went out as one ballot for both streets, and then we had to redo it. Um, so that actually that took extra time. But um, from what I understand, both streets were approved. Uh, they got the required votes. 
to go through the process with the prices in hand. So Reed Street and Thesa Street are separate. Katina represents Reed Street and I represent Thesa Street. But we started the process, you know, two years ago under both streets, but we just had to do it separately. We went through the conservation board. They approved with requirements that they want us to adhere to. I spoke to the contractor about those and he said no problem. So, and also the contract said he's been talking to town engineering as well. So they should be in sync of what's going on. Basically what we're doing is we're, we're repaving the road. It's going to be, I think there's going to be, it's going to be grounded up and then that's going to be the base. And then there's going to be a second layer and the third layer. Multiple layers. I think also the point that John makes that, you know, we did this once. We went door knocking. We talked to our neighbors. We, we heard some objections. We addressed those. And while, you know, while there, there are always going to be some people who are not in favor. We certainly had, we met the threshold and the requirements of the town in terms of the numbers. And then we thought we were all set. And then we discovered that in fact, we couldn't do it as two streets combined. We had to go back and do it all over again as two separate individual streets. And so we went back out and we knocked on doors and we listened to our neighbors. We talked to our neighbors and we once again came up with the required number of approvals. So, you know, we've, we've kind of done this twice. Mr. Mr. Heim. Mr. Chair, if I may try to be helpful. So just for an explanation for the abutter applicants, the board is oftentimes supplied with a brief memorandum outlining the actual project itself. Sometimes there are accompanying pictures that might show the condition of the private way. Conferring with Ms. Marr very quickly, it sounds like engineering and ISD have approved the project. It may be that the current organization of ISD hasn't gone through one of these before, but it doesn't sound like, it sounds like ISD and engineering who would normally at least be involved into a review with respect to the layout and set the conditions are in agreement that the roads need to be redone and have worked with the contractors to develop an appropriate scope. Thus, what's really before the board is whether or not this specific set of betterments are worthy of the town essentially financing these projects. And obviously the board can decide it doesn't have enough information, but there's no technical requirement that you're missing. So if you want to hear from members of the public who might want to say anything about it, you certainly can. I understand what members are saying. Usually they have a little bit more visual and written information than you have in this instance, but it sounds like all those boxes are checked. They just weren't put together in a memo for you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hyman. That was very helpful. And so I know this is a hearing at some point we'll hear from. Would you like to entertain motions now or after public comment? Is there a preference this time? I think that if Mr. Hurd wants to move now, he can move now, but you should open it up to the public at some point. So while we do a public comment. Okay. And I was going to say, while I have your name correctly in mind, I was going to take it, but let's do it. So let's hear from the public if there are any. This is a hearing, so we're happy to hear from anyone who wants to comment on the Reed Street betterment. Hello, this is Mark Schuster. I'm a resident of Reed Street. My comment is half of Reed Street is in very good condition. So the portion of Reed Street that is closest to Summer Street is in very good condition. It's really the intersection of Reed and Thesda that has the potholes. In fact, the portion that's directly next to Summer Street is pretty much paved separately and in very good condition. For most residents of Reed Street, we travel directly to Summer Street because that's the main road that reaches the highway. And we do not need to travel through Thesda Street to reach Summer Street and other main roads. So that portion is in excellent condition. And 
the rest of us are being, you know, subsidizing the cost to pave the rest of the neighborhood. Now, I have a copy of the petition document that was submit that I obtained through a public records request. Um, if you look at the document that says petition form, repair of private way petition form, on the first line, it combines three streets together, Reed, Thesda, and Dothan. Um, even though uh, the ballots were counted separately, the bylaws require that the petition form itself consider each street separately without an HOA. Uh, so there is no HOA. Um, even if we repave it, there will still be potholes, and an HOA would allow for ongoing fees to provide the maintenance of this road. There are no sidewalks on this street, and if we are going to repave it, we should consider the addition of sidewalks, and that's not really being considered here. Um, this is also an excessive cost for many of the residents who are going to have to pay $3,000 each to repave it when, uh, for many of us, uh, the road is completely usable and in much better condition than some of the other private ways, uh, which you know, are barely paved at all. Um, the town itself is also an abutter to, I believe, three lots. Um, and so the town itself, I do not believe, is, is contributing to that $44,000 cost. Um, so yeah, those are some of my, my comments concerning it. Um, I also looked at the responses. Um, it looks like at least three residents did not vote at all. Um, so those are my concerns with um, the town moving forward in that it should only really consider the portion that needs the repairs instead of repaving the entire road and putting the cost on all of the residents of the road. All right. Thank you. And we'll move on now to Mr. Um, Rosenblum. I'm sorry, um, I think that's Ed Harmon next. Thank you for your attention. I'm a resident in a butter for um, for Des um, Street, and um, the road is in, de in dire the in dire straits, both both Des and with all respect to to my the previous uh, caller, a good chunk of Reed Street is in is at at its at its end. Even for the, well, there's probably two or three houses that that whose, where the road is. Um, Reasonably paved. The rest of it is is uh, just patched, and it's it is a bit of a uh, uh, <laughs> a slalom to get by there without running into a pothole. Um, so uh, this is this project is definitely in in, in need of, of um, both for both safety purposes. To, if a an uh, ambulance needs to get by, or the fire department, or the fire trucks need to get through to any piece of either Reed or Thesda, there's definitely an impairment. Uh, it just, it just it's, 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 it's both a public, it's a hazard to, to drivers, it's a hazard to, uh, to people walking on the road, it's a hazard to, bike, to bicyclists and even pedestrians who, uh, where a car might, have, might swerve out of the way to get into a pothole. Uh, it's just, there just really is not a, a, a viable path through this, this area at all. Thank you. So, let's yeah, I, I, one thing I, I also would add to that, um, th there's been a few injuries um, that have been documented as well. Uh, a bicyclist uh, got stitches in their face uh, when they hit a pothole on Reed Street, and that wasn't uh, towards the end of Reed Street, it was in the middle of Reed Street. Um, also, a child was, was hurt on Thesda Street um, before Halloween, uh, where the, the town did start to do some repairs after that, but we had to prove that we were going through this process. So uh, definitely second Michael's uh, comments there, that it is dangerous. Thank you. So, um, uh, um, There's one more member of the public that would wish to speak. Okay. I didn't see the hand up here. 
I thought that was. That's uh, Mr. Lee. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. You know, so, all right, thanks. Ms. Harmon? Um, I'm, I'm concerned that the um, firstly the cost is uh, difficult for some of us on the street and I don't feel that there's been enough justification that the work really needs to be done. Um, all, all I've heard is anecdotes. But I, I don't hear any kind of significant data that this is really required. Um, secondly, I see vehicles driving past my house at speeds that are already too high for the street, given how narrow and windy it is. I, I tend to think that a few bumps helps to slow down the traffic. and. I'd be interested to hear if we would have like other traffic calming measures if the street is improved. Um, the street is narrow. There's no way you're going to fit sidewalks on the street. There's plenty of people out walking and kids out walking down the street, and I'm concerned, you know, about. Uh, Increasing the speed of traffic on the road can be the thanks for my point. All right, thank you, Ms. Harmon. So, it's heard. I believe this question has been asked before, but I'll have a I'm just clarify. We can't, under the Betterment Act, approve half a street. Right? It has to be the entire street. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hurd, you can approve a portion of the street as long as the portion that we're talking about uh, had two thirds of the portion vote in, or, or petition in favor of the betterment. So it is possible to reduce the scope of betterment. The board hasn't traditionally done that a lot because it's it oftentimes involves a revised cost estimate, and then you know the abutters have to sort of circle the wagons. People may not ultimately want to go forward with the project if all the cost is being borne by a smaller amount of people, but it is it is possible. And it's been done mostly in instances where there was like one abutter at the end of a roadway as to folks as opposed to folks in the middle. Can I make one other point just so yes. it's clear for the public? The town is only in a butter under the bylaw when there's essentially a town property that is utilized extensively by the public or the town. So if there's like a town playground or park and folks are always essentially parking or driving or doing well, I don't know to say parking, driving or accessing the park in that specific place, then um, the town can be in a butter for the purposes of the petition and the assessment of costs. Otherwise, um, the town isn't considered in a butter. If it's one of, some of these random parcels that the town took in tax title, those don't count. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. Thank you. Um, and just to clarify a few points are, that were brought up, I don't think we've ever, as part of the betterment process, put sidewalks in, and the town can't put sidewalks on private ways because the the owners own that property. Um, so, I mean, generally when we have these applications, I feel like it's a happy time, and we usually have just put all all um, abutters in agreement. It's unfortunate when somebody feels that they have to pay for something that they don't want. But in this particular, I did a quick calculation. I think we have about 70, even with the, without the responses, there's still about 75% of the street has voted in favor of this and agreed to it. And the, our job in this situation is not to make a determination whether or not there's an exigent need, but just to see, see if they've complied with the requirements to have the town finance this type of project. And here they have, and they've done the work, and um, I'm inclined to 
support this. So I will move approval of the betterment application. And just to clarify, this is a specific hearing for Reed Street. Right. So this is a move approval of the betterment application for Reed Street. Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll second Mr. Hurd's motion. And just for, for my own clarification, the, the scope of uh, services for the project was the entirety of Reed Street. Is that is that correct? I don't I don't know who can answer that for the uh, for the neighbors. Well, I'm going to suggest that we go to uh, Katina because she has her hand up, and maybe she can answer this question. Yes, it was for the full length of Reed Street. Okay. All right. So, 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 given that, and that's what I thought I heard earlier, and, and even under a, a different analysis, I see I see one no vote on on Reed Street. There, there are a few uh, neighbors that didn't respond, but that that is over the two thirds. And in my experience, where we've seen it less than the full street, it's been in recognition. Like we're going to have Elmhurst Road in here later tonight. Well, part of Elmhurst Road was paved by a, a project that was done on the corner of Mass Ave, and they, they asked to have another section paved, recognizing that their butter had already paved a portion of it here, where it applies to the whole street where the two-third criteria or threshold was met, I'm inclined to support it as well. Okay, so, anything else? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I often say this as a resident of a private way myself, um, I think no one disputes that uh, the situation that private way residents and indeed the entire town are stuck with with private ways is, is necessarily fair. Um, but it's the system we have and that we can't do anything about. Um, and that, you know, for better or for worse, uh, we who live in private ways have to pay for the road surfacing. Um, and I think our, our bylaw, you know, the supermajority uh, provides a process to do that. I agree with my colleague, Mr. Hurd, that at this point, you know, our job is to make sure that the process has been followed and, and the proposal is in order um, and it sounds to me like it is so um, you know with sympathy to the people for whom this uh, is not a something they want um, I will have to be glad to support it as well. Oh, thank you Mr. Helmets and um, Katina are your hand is still up do you want to say something? No sorry. Oh, all right no problem you know so uh, yeah I agree with everything that that I've heard you know, from my colleagues on this. I mean, it is the nature of a, of a private way, you know, and, and so, uh, yeah. And so um, with a motion by Mr. Hurd and a second by uh, Mr. Corsi, Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. It's a four zero vote. Thank you, Tina. Uh, and uh, we'll move on to now a hearing on Desler Street. And, and uh, we have um, John Scissors, uh, the resident here. I mean, I think if you want to say something, but I think we know what you're going to say. But if you want to say something more. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't think anything here needs to be repeated. We understand the benefits of having the roads repaired. Uh, I think we have everything in line of what we need to do uh, to get the road done. Um, so. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. So at this point, if we have any residents that want to speak to that's the street. Mr. Chair, yes. just a suggestion you might uh, instruct them to raise their hands in Zoom as a way of, of indicating that. Sure. So as um, my colleague just suggested, if you want to raise your hand in Zoom, um, if you have any comments, or anyone wants to comment on um, that's the street? I'm not seeing anyone. Seeing no hands. Okay. Right. Move approval. Okay, Mr. On second. a motion to approve by Mr. Helmets. Second. And a second by Mr. Corsi. Any? Yep. Yeah, second for the same reasons we just talked about. <laughs> so. On uh, a uh, motion to approve of the amendment by Mr. Helmuth and a second by Mr. DeCourcy. Mr. Hahn? Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. It's a 4 0 vote. Thank you. And uh, so moving on now to um, Elmas Hurd. I'm sorry, Elmas Road Betterment. And we have Lori Bogdan as a resident.
Yes, yes I'm here. I'm Laurie Bogdan. Thank you for having me. Hi. Um, so is there anything you want to say? Um, about Elmhurst Road? Yes. Sure. Um, similar situation. We are Elmhurst Road doing half of our road. The other half was done a year or two ago. Our road also is in poor condition. Um, we have worked very closely um, with the town engineers and chosen our contractor. We do have all of our required um, approvals from the abutters. Um, we feel that it is important at this time to pave our road for the safety of the cars, the cyclists, and emergency vehicles and pedestrians. Um, we do hope that the process that we're going through and the way we're paving will help with um, traffic mitigation, um, keeping people safe, keeping traffic going slowly. And that is our situation, and we look forward to getting approval for our betterment process. Thank you, Ms. Bogdan. So, um, Mr. Hurt? Um, I guess my, my only question, and I think the proponent might be able to answer this best, is there a, some sort of prohibition from cut through traffic that has been implemented? Because I feel like on Elmhurst Road, the condition of the road was al always the prohibition to <laughs> prevent people from avoiding Lake Street traffic and cutting down Mass Ave. It, does that have a, any sort of do not enter in a certain period of time? Are you asking me or are you asking people on the sport? I don't know if Attorney Heim knows every <laughs> <laughs> prohibition in Arlington, but I'll give him the first shot. I'll defer to the actual residents of Elmhurst Road. As to <laughs> yeah. They can speak to that, but I, I have a relevant um, point to it. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I can speak to that. Um, at the Mass Ave end of Elmhurst Road, there is one sign that says, um, do not enter if you're not a resident from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Um, we would very much appreciate having more signage that helps with mitigation of traffic. Yes, indeed, the road is in bad condition. It does not really stop cut through, I have to say, unfortunately. Um, but the road has deteriorated a, a great deal in recent years. So we are in a situation where it is time to pave. And we are going to work towards any kind of signage that we can to help out with the cut through traffic. Okay. My, my concern is actually more going the other way. Um, people going down Brooks Ave. And they there is no through. signage the other way. So there's no, so people can cut through from Lake Street to Mass Ave that way during, well, it's a, it's a separate issue anyways. Um, and it's something that maybe we can look at it. At a future it is very but. unfortunate. We do need signs. Um, we would like to work with the town on that. We do have cut through from from Lake Street. Do you live in the area? No, I live up in the Heights. I used to live in that area, but I'm just, I am familiar with the road. Yeah. Um, um, and I, I don't want to go down a go down a rabbit hole that's not before us because yeah. we're not talking um, about our, it. Our plan that we've worked on with the town engineer um, is to have uh, delineation signs on both ends because we are slightly changing the um, configuration of the road that will warrant having delineation signs which should help with traffic mitigation. The horsey. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll second Mr. Hurd's. Did you make a motion or? No. I'll move approval. Okay. okay. I'll, second, I'll second the motion. Just a question for Ms. Bogdan. I have a memory of you being before us last summer. Was that for a different part of the street or, or the road or did, it, did the work just not get done and you're back before us again this year to do what was proposed a year ago? No, the, the thought that I think you're speaking about our road being partially paved. Yes. Um, 
It partially was paved on the Mass Ave side because, as you discussed earlier, a small portion of the people on that side went through the betterment process and were approved for that. Um, our end of the road was not ready to pave. Now we are. Okay. All right. I, 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 sorry. I, I had a memory of having a discussion about this a year ago because, and, and discussing the traffic concerns as well. But I, I, I see that the request here is from Elmhurst from Randolph Street to Brooks Ave, and, and I'm happy to support it. But I, I may be mistaken in terms of what that discussion was a year ago. You are not mistaken. Um, I too was at that meeting along with other neighbors that live on our street. We did have that discussion on signage. It has not been completely resolved and we are hoping that it would be, but the town did do a survey and they were working with us on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. So uh, now if any residents would like to speak in the hearing part, uh, of this um, discussion, uh, just raise your hand. Um. And use the, the raise hand in Zoom. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands either. So I think we're all set here. All right, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. Corsi, Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. It's a 4 0 vote. Great. So thank you, everybody. Yeah. Good luck with your. Um, thank you. All right. Bye bye. So we'll now move on to open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. So um, once again, if you can raise your hands um, electronically in Zoom, uh, we will compile a list and, and we'll take that list in the order in which the hands are raised. And, and um, after maybe 10, 15 more seconds, we're gonna take, that will end the list. And, and so, if you want to talk, get your hands up. Please raise your hands now. And, um, and so the order in which I see them are um, Lynette Culverhouse, Judith Garber, Rebecca Peterson, Elizabeth Dre. And that's going to be the um, list for tonight's open forum. So we'll start with um, Lynette Culverhouse. Hello, Ms. Coverhouse. I can't hear you. You're still muted. Okay, got it. Great. <laughs> um, Lynette Coverhouse, Draper Avenue. Thank you for hearing me tonight. Um, so I'm disappointed at the proposed policy to not fly any banners on town, at town hall or other town uh, lampposts. While I understand the fear that is surely driving this decision, I also know that the authoritarianism that is gripping our country fuels itself on fear. The gradual descent into fascism in the US is clear and the normalization of events and decisions that are truly shocking to those outside this country is reminiscent of the normalization of fascism in Germany. I would like to think that here in Arlington we could avoid falling into this trap that limits our freedom of expression and yields to fear mongering. Surely we here in our beloved town can hold the high watch and resist the temptation to fall prey to the outside forces that would limit all our freedoms. Please take the time to think deeply about the implications of removing Arlington's right to freely express the values they hold dear and to bring healing to our divided town. Town meeting clearly expressed their desire to publicly display the BLM banner and to show that we are a welcoming town for all. With this policy, we will no longer be free to fly the pride banner either. Please don't silence those who would actively seek to heal and unite. 
This is a moment for spiritual and moral introspection. I'd like to ask you to not vote to approve tonight and take whatever time it takes to expand the conversation in order to make a decision that is grounded in clarity, justice, and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coverhaus. So next we have Rebecca Peterson. Hello. Hello, uh, Judith Garber, Massachusetts Avenue, Precinct 4. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hello, Select Board. Uh, I'm speaking on the same matter as Ms. Culverhouse. Uh, I was very disappointed to see the new policy prohibiting any banner on the town hall building. It's in direct opposition to the resolution that town meeting passed last year. Um, if the Select Board is concerned about banners getting too political, I would argue that Black Lives Matter in particular, it's a statement of, of human rights, it's not a political position. Uh, and as white supremacist movements are growing in Massachusetts, uh, it's more important now than ever that we assert that Black Lives Matter. So with this policy, it just seems like a step in the wrong direction, like the town is sort of we're cutting off our nose to spite our face. Rather than offend those who oppose Black Lives Matter, we won't take a stand on even the most basic civil rights issues. Um, Somerville, for example, has had a BLM banner on their city hall since 2016. Unfortunately, it's still very relevant. So I, I guess my concern is, you know, what is the town going to do when, I, I hope this doesn't happen, God willing, but if there's another George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, things like this are happening really regularly. And so what is the town going to do when this happens again? Just shrug and say, well, we don't allow any banners, so too bad. So, I mean, it seems like we could really think of a better policy. I know many people would be more than happy to help with this. I'd be more than happy to help with this. So um, I, I'm urging you to vote this down and try and think of a more of a, of a better way to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garber. I see what's going wrong with my calling out the names next. So, so, so I'm looking at the, the list of participants and you're pulling people in beforehand. So I get it. Sorry about that. So, so uh, will you tell me who's next, please? Um, Rebecca Peterson. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I was unable to attend the public forum, re uh, forum regarding the overnight parking uh, ban slash pilot program in June. So I, I'm not sure if this is the correct time or place to make comments about that. Sure you can. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to um, express my support for continuing the overnight parking ban in Arlington. Um, I understand that a study is underway to, I guess, design um, the overnight parking pilot uh, program. But uh, in my opinion, getting rid of the parking ban is a fast and easy way to degrade the quality of life in all of our neighborhoods. Um, from my experience living in another town, um, just about 10 minutes from here, residents tend to treat public ways as their personal garages and cars get parked on the street and literally never move for months and months at a time. I think removing the overnight parking ban is a drastic change and it will affect um, many, many things about Arlington, aesthetics, public safety and quality of life. More cars parked all the time on the street will mean that the streets are difficult to navigate and this will probably also result in higher car insurance rates. Um, additionally, I'm not sure if the, again, I missed the forum, but I don't believe the police have the manpower to monitor this situation with, you know, maybe hundreds of people requesting permits. I don't, I don't know that the police have the, the manpower to monitor this on a nightly basis. Um, so in essence, that means that any new rules quickly become meaningless if they can't be enforced, essentially removing the ban without actually voting to remove the overnight parking ban. Um, lastly, I think it, uh, it is also sort of contradictory to um, rules or maybe rules is the wrong word, but uh, recent efforts to reduce or remove parking spots from newly permitted developments in town. So you're pushing the problem of the developer who has a building and maybe doesn't have enough spots and wants to reduce them, now you're pushing that onto everyone in town. So if you're just saying, 
oh, well, this building doesn't have to have spots, but it's fine. Everyone can park, you know, at wherever they want overnight. I just, okay, thank you. So that, that's all I have to say. I just respectfully ask that you maintain the overnight parking ban in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you. And next. And the last speaker is Ms. Dre. Thank you. Good evening, good evening. Uh, Elizabeth Dre, um, town meeting member in precinct 10. Um, I'd like to speak about the banner, uh, the, the policy. Um, I'd like to provide a little history so that residents who are listening tonight understand my profound disappointment in the proposed banner and sign policy that is up for vote tonight. October 2018 was a difficult time for Arlington um, regarding how our town government dealt with systematic racism and racist individuals within our public institutions. And it will be no surprise to this board that I was not proud of how Arlington handled it. But on June 8th in 2020, we put up a Black Lives Matter banner on the Arlington Town Hall with the town officials, the chief of police, all of our elected officials there. I brought my family to see it. And I was so excited. I felt a little bit of that pride returning. And then the banner came down and the select board and the town manager over those last couple of years, three years, made false promises, sorry, two years, about what would happen to it and how the community would be involved in that decision-making process. Then town manager promised to work with the Human Rights Commission, the DEI coordinator and community stakeholders to develop a policy, but that outreach was never done. I have an email from Adam Chapdelaine, who wrote that, quote, his recommendation will be to keep up the banner indefinitely, unquote. And I believed him until he specifically proposed that it come down and had no plan in place. So then in December 2020, the special town meeting overwhelmingly passed a resolution asking the select board to return the Black Lives Matter banner to town hall. Our elected representatives spoke and the select board chose to ignore them. Then on January 4th, 2021, the select board discussed a memorandum written by then select member, Mr. Kiro and Mr. DeCourcy, which recommended that the banner be hung on town hall from MLK Jr.'s birthday through the end of February, which is Black History Month. Two select board members developed four recommendations and presented them, yet the rest of the select board at that time effectively ignored their work and then for over a year ignored their promises and the Black Lives Matter banner was never mentioned again by the select board members until residents of Arlington petitioned the select board earlier this year to put it on agenda. And you did. But then you deferred due to a pending legal case that has since been resolved. And then you had two of your members who had previously spoken that they don't support any banners on town meeting to develop a town meeting policy, a, a, on town hall to develop such a policy, which unsurprisingly says, no banners on town hall ever. And that's where we are tonight. Tonight you will vote on a policy to prevent any statement of Arlington's values on our center of government, the town hall. No Black Lives Matter, no pride, no public expression of what we as a value as a town on important social and human rights issues. No public commitment as a town to uphold human rights. I'm finishing up, Lynn. <laughs> um, and I feel like we're playing it safe at a time where our community members, those of us with uteruses, people of color, gender queer and immigrant community members are having our human rights challenged and stripped from us daily. Arlington okay, should be speaking out and leading time. and this is not the time to be silent. Time's Thank you. Up. Thank you. I just need to keep it equal here. So that's it. Thank you. So Thank you. Um, I think that's going to end um, open forum. So we'll now move on to item 10 on the agenda's discussion, upcoming authorized use limitation for Arlington High School properties. And so, Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, be, prior to this discussion, I, I am gonna recuse myself that this is gonna be a discussion about Arlington High School and activity and use limitation, but one of the industrial parties, um, while I have nothing to do with this matter is a client of mine, so for that reason, consistency, um, I'm going to step out for, for this portion of the agenda tonight. Great. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Mr. Hunt? Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, I just want to say a few brief introductory remarks, then I'm going to turn it over to our uh, special counsel for environmental matters, Tom Fiore of Credit Flaherty. Uh, the short version of this is there's no action being requested of the select board tonight. What we're trying to do is essentially prime the pump 
for what will later be an authorized use limitation that will seek <coughs> approval from this board. Now, the high school property is technically listed as town property for the purposes of the deed, so you'll need to vote on it. Uh, we will take other measures to make sure the school committee understands and is comfortable with the limitations that are being placed on the site. None of this is dramatically new. None of this is a huge departure from the status quo of the high school fields for a long, long time, except for formalizing some agreements and making sure we're clear about what we can do and what we can't do without the services of what's called a licensed site professional. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Fury. He's been our environmental counsel since 2011. Is that right, Tom? Yes. Uh, and he is a specialist in something that is very, very technical. So I'm happy to turn it over to him to make sure that it's all gotten right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Horry. Good evening. Um, Doug pretty much said it all. Uh, <laughs> you have all uh, received my memo, which gave a very high level uh, summary of the site history. And when I say site, I'm using the term in the regulatory sense. It's everywhere where the contamination has ended up. And the contamination we're talking about relates to a, a former manufactured gas facility. Uh, a former saw blade chroming operation and some of the DPW's historical operations all sort of generally centered in around 51 Grove Street where the DPW yard is now but also extending onto the Arlington High School property and some also some adjacent properties uh, just uh, almost tangentially to 51 Grove and in Arlington High School. Uh, the process that uh, we've been engaged in with the industrial parties since 2001, since the settlement, uh, has been one where the industrial parties have taken the lead in doing the major work that's necessary to address this historical contamination. And the major work was completed uh, in 2007. And since then, uh, and that major work consi consisted of um, relocating utilities into clean corridors so that to the extent they need to be worked on in the future, they're in an area that in and of itself does not pr present an unacceptable risk to, uh, to workers, uh, consolidating and capping the contaminated material under either an engineered barrier or a direct contact barrier, which basically um, renders the, the material that would otherwise pose an unacceptable risk is isolated and, and does not, uh, there's no exposure pathway to use semi-technical parlance as long as the barriers are maintained, as long as they're, uh, inspected periodically, um, things of that nature. And since 2007, the town and the industrial parties have been maintaining these, these barriers and also monitoring groundwater. Um, so what we're gonna be coming back to you with, hopefully in, I, I, if I have to guess, I'd say this fall, um, is a formalization of what we've been doing since 2007. It, it's it, the AUL, the activity and use limitation is a notice. It goes on, it's, re, it's recorded at the registry and basically it sets out, here are the conditions that exist at the site. Here are activities that are consistent with maintaining a condition of no significant risk. Here are activities that are inconsistent with maintaining a condition of no significant risk. So it's out there to the public, out there to anybody who has any uh, need to know what the conditions of the property are. The AUL also includes the monitoring and maintenance requirements going forward, which will be handled by the industrial parties going forward. Uh, but once this AUL is, is recorded and the grant of easement that goes with it, uh, and I'll give you a little historical background on that in a second. But once those documents are executed and the AUL is recorded, then the, uh, the final report, if you will, relating to the investigation and remediation of the portion of the site relating to Arlington High School can be filed with DEP. And that, will, that, that work will be done 
subject to the ongoing monitoring and maintenance requirements that are reflected in the AUL. Now, the reason we have a grant of easement accompanying the AUL is because the industrial parties need to lock in their right to come onto the property to do what they need to do going forward. So they've, as part of the settlement back in 2001, there was language in the agreement that said not only do all the parties agree that the way to approach this contamination will be through um, measures that will be supported by an AUL, but there will also be a grant of, of an easement to allow the industrial parties going forward to continue their obligations. Um, the only other thing I'll point out is the process we're talking about with regard to the Arlington High School portion of the property was followed four years ago with regard to the DPW property. There's an AUL on the DPW property. There's a grant of easement relating to the DPW pro property as well because the industrial parties have ongoing obligations there. So um, with that, I mean, I'm happy to dive into the weeds on what an AUL is or the regulatory process or whatever, whatever you feel would be uh, helpful at this point, recognizing that in hopefully a couple months, we'll be coming back to you with the actual document uh, that we'll be requesting the, the board execute. So. All right, great, thank you. Open up. Uh, go with Mr. Helmuth first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your patience this evening and for your uh, very helpful and detailed memo. Um, learned some interesting history I didn't know before. Um, what kind, of, if you're able to say now, I know that the AOL is in draft form, but can you give some an example or two of the kind of activities that would be um, inconsistent with preserving a, a state of no significant risk? Uh, residential use, industrial use, agricultural use. Mm -hmm. Nothing that is happening now on the Arlington High School property will be prohibited or be viewed as being inconsistent mm -hmm. with uh, the AUL. So, as long as the monitoring and maintenance requirements are uh -huh. maintained. Yeah. And thank you. And what kind of enforcement, who does the enforcement, what are the enforcement um, options in, in powers for, you know, for the, the moving forward the terms of that AOL? Uh, well, as the, the town certainly has its rights under the settlement agreement to enforce the obligations of the industrial parties, but ultimately, uh, and ultimately, the DEP has enforcement power. Thank you. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Mr. Hur. Thank you. Um, I'll move receipt oh, yeah. of the memo. Second. Yeah. And thank you for all the work. It's very detailed. Um, I won't have you get, get into the weeds on AULs tonight. Maybe we'll have a follow-up conversation at some point in the next few months as we come into the fall. But, again, I've heard about this. I've known... I've known about this issue for years, I think since I was young, but it's good to see that we're moving in the right direction and all the work that's been done to get us to this point. Um, so again, thank you for your work. And I would just say, as an attorney, Mr. Chair, and knowing how attorneys bill, if we have attorneys here on the Arlington Dime, we should probably take them first on the agenda next time. <laughs> but that being said, we are happy to have you here at our, joining us at our meeting. So. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you for thank you thank you for that suggestion. You know, and and I'll, it, it, I really don't have any questions. You know, this was laid out very nicely. You know, I, uh, I guess, you know, we have a little a little more time than I thought we would, so I can't resist. So, what's the UST? UST is an underground storage tank. Okay, great. You know, uh, so that explains that. You know, uh, so. Uh, uh, I am. I'm a government person, you know, and and I'm, I'm just impressed with what you know, we do you know, to mitigate the you know, environmental damage. I mean, and, and the number of steps and the number of details you know, that you know, the amount of detail work that it takes you know, to really take care of a situation like that. And I'm, I'm you know, I, I like seeing seeing this laid out. So good job, and thank you for coming to us early me giving us a first pass at it so that we're more prepared me when you come back later on so so um, thank you and and I know mr. Heim did you want to say something Mr. Heim? 
Okay. And I know that Ms. Hive said that we didn't really need to take any action on this, but we do have a motion to receive and, and, and a second. And, um, a second uh, on that to the motion by Mr. Hearn and a second by Mr. Hobbit. So, Mr. Hine, yeah? Before I take the vote, if I may make a quick comment, Mr. Sure. Uh, Chair. I just want to note that one, uh, the legal department's been very impressed and grateful for uh, Attorney Fury's representation in this matter. Uh, this is obviously very technical stuff and involves uh, a whole cabinet full of uh, legal documents and plans and technical data. Uh, the other thing that I just want to stress, and Mr. Fury can correct me if I'm making any incorrect statements here, but the thing for the public to know is that there is no significant risk under Mass DEP's very strict guidelines. One of the benefits of living in a wonderful state like the Commonwealth is that we have strict guidelines uh, for what's safe and what's not safe. And the whole point of this is that the site is safe as long as we do what we're supposed to be doing. And that's part of what uh, the legal team led by Mr. Fury is trying to make sure that we consistently do. One other, one other thing I, I, I sh perhaps anticipating a question that the public may have, the ongoing construction at the high school is all being done by a licensed site professional, is being overseen by a licensed site professional working for the town who has all the documents that have been filed with the DEP regarding site conditions, who had to come up with a plan called a release abatement measure plan, which recognized those conditions and spelled out how the construction could proceed without running afoul of the, of the remediation that has already been done, and how to the extent those barriers needed to be adjusted or, or, or opened up even temporarily, how a condition of no significant risk would be maintained during those temporary uh, periods. And that was also, I might add, the same process that's being followed at the DPW yard with regard to conditions that over there. So, thank you, Tom. Okay. Not quite as complex as depressing a sense for artery, but, but kind of that. <laughs> so, so, so uh, on that, Mr. Hyde, you know? Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. So 3-0 vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll go get Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you. Nice. Okay. Good night. Take care. I know. That's what I was going to say. Name and address, please. <laughs> So I meant to say this at the beginning of the meeting, you know, um, I, if around nine inches after anyone wants to take a break, just let me know and we'll take a five, ten minute break, whatever, whatever's necessary, all right? Otherwise, I mean, I'll probably just barrel through because that's just what I tend to do. So, okay, you know, so item number 11, update on double polls. And so I turn to Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, it, it, as the board knows, that there have been various times in the past year and a half that we've had discussions about the number of double poles in Arlington and our desire to see them reduced as, as, as quickly as possible. And what I provided uh, as an attachment, or what taught an attachment to our agenda this evening, is the most recent report that Verizon submitted to the Department of Public Utilities uh, outlining for the period from November 1, 2021 to April 30, 2022, the number of double poles that are still in the town. Uh, at the beginning of the time period, there was 113 double poles. They are now reporting that there are 86. And so when I first brought this issue up before the board, or at least during my time on the board, um, there was about 148 double poles in town. So on paper, this looks like a good thing. 
I will say I, I question the list uh, a little bit because um, behind the summary um, that's included with the agenda is a detailed list of all the double pole locations. And just looking at Mass Ave, uh, there are two double poles listed on the report. If you were to drive from Lexington to the Cambridge border on Mass Ave, you'd find six double poles on Mass Ave. Um, and, and so that was a, a, a spot check, including the one at the corner of Mass Ave and Adams. That has been a constant um, problem, frankly, and, 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 and a safety hazard. So earlier this year, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine um, had talked about putting the list up on the town website and asking people to add locations that um, may have double poles that aren't on the list. Unfortunately, he was not able to do that prior to his, his leave and coordinate that. I've had a brief discussion with Mr. Pooler. I think we're gonna talk about it again later this week. So I would ask uh, Mr. Pooler if, if he could coordinate the, the schedule here um, to, to provide that for residents to give us feedback. The second thing that we were going to attempt to do is to bring all the parties together who have fixtures on the poles because it's Verizon's obligation to maintain the poles, but there are other companies that use the poles. And Verizon's position earlier this year was that they are in compliance. They're just waiting for the other companies to remove their materials so they can put a new pole up. It sounds to me like there's a communication issue there that I think you know, we need to, to get involved with. So um, that's another item that uh, we voted this, a request of Mr. Chapdelaine to coordinate the parties. I think that motion is still live. I, I will follow up with Mr. Pooler on that as well. So I, I think while there's some good news here, I think there's some problematic polls that, that I mentioned. There's one on Warren Street that is particularly problematic as well. Um, so I'd like to see this continue and see the communication better. Um, and I just thought the public and the board would be interested to see where, where Verizon is. Every six months, they file a report with the DPU, and, and my intent, as long as I'm on the board, is to compile that and, and present where we are. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Mr. Hurd? Move receipt. And then, again, I think we can do this every time, but thank Mr. Corsi for your continued leadership on this issue. Uh, it is something that you, when you, you get elected to public office, you're like, you have a envision the things that you're going to talk about with residents and double polls come up a lot. <laughs> That's never what you thought when you pull papers for the job, but it is important and there are safety issues and the one, a few of them on mass average just, I think we've highlighted those specific polls and it's a little disappointing that the most egregious polls haven't been taken out. But again, the numbers look good. Uh, I haven't spot checked the numbers. So when I looked at it, I, I said, oh, we're, we're moving in the right direction. I think we're getting their attention, but more efforts need to be, or efforts need to continue to be pr pressed on this to remove more of the double poles and make sure that they don't add more double poles. So let's keep them honest and make sure that they're giving us the right information, but keep moving in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. I'll just do some quick math and according to those calculations and your stated intention to do this as long as you remain on the board, um, if there's 86 polls left um, and we go at 18 a year, that's about five years. <laughs> so we look forward to your continued well, well, <laughs> serving with you. I will say for as long as, yeah, not until they're done. <laughs> not promising that. Well, the town would benefit if you did stay on the job that long, Mr. DeCourcy. <laughs> Thank you. So well, so then, so then, so we're not seeing them adding any. Is that the deal? Is that explained? Well, they're removing more than they're adding. Um, they add, they only added one in this last time period. Yeah, because I didn't see any added in twenty one. You know, so 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 that's what we are hoping for. Well, it, and, and removing the backlog because in, in theory they're supposed to remove the double pole ninety days after the double pole goes up. Right. Uh, and so that's. We're, we're trying to keep them going forward within the 90 day period right. and reduce the backlog um, that's been uh, generated over the years. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, I noticed that there's one that's been there since 2004. You know, yeah. so. and, and it probably was before 2004. This, this order from the Department of Public Utilities came out at the end of 2003. <laughs> and what they did is they basically used 2004 as a starting point. So when you see 2004, it probably has been there prior to then. 
Yeah. So then, do you know what the criteria is for removing a double pole? Like, what's what determines whether they remove a double pole? Oh no, they're, they're supposed to remove a double pole. This once a new pole goes in, you have 90 days because there's equipment on the wires, and you have to coordinate with the various utilities and cable companies. And so, there's not supposed to after 90 days. Once you put a new pole in you should be removing the old pole. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, so so no, there's no criteria for keeping it other than you haven't done the switch. Okay, I mean, I, I was with you right up until the end. I mean, or, so of the backlog, how do they prioritize removing the back? I don't know. I That's mean, clearly, I'm clearly they don't, based on condition of the pole. Right. Right. Okay, you know, so. I, and, and they might. That's not fair, but this Adam Street pole is an extreme yeah. Pole and it's an embarrassment that it's it's there and it's unsafe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, uh, thank you. <laughs> so, and, and look forward to reporting. Six months. You know. So, uh, 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 motion to receipt by uh, Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's a four-zero vote. Thank you. Moving on, item 12, uh, we have a discussion of a letter of support for open space and for the open space and recreation plan. And, and so I think probably Mr. Heim will give us a little introduction first, I mean, and then we'll bring on. Uh, and, and let me just add that I really appreciate you know, the letter that you wrote on relatively uh, short notice. You know, uh, so uh, good job and appreciate your efforts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to very briefly summarize, um, the uh, Open Space Committee has done a tremendous amount of work in conjunction with some uh, with a variety of departments and a whole host of other committees to develop this open space and recreation plan that gets submitted to the Executive Office of uh, Energy and Environmental Affairs um, for its uh, essential approval. Um, We've been operating under one open space and recreation plan for five years. This is essentially an update uh, from my reading of these materials. Uh, it well reflects building off of the successes of previous plans, as well as looking forward to the future, to uh, forward the, all the goals that I set forth in the letter. I'm not the expert, uh, Mr. Royer is, so I will uh, 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 hand it over to her. But um, if there's anything that the board obviously wants to change in the letter, highlight, Alter, it's your letter, uh, but I hope it reflects the board's overall uh, thinking and approach to the excellent work of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And Ms. Arroyo? Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me come tonight, and thank you for um, reviewing the Open Space and Recreation Plan uh, and um, for all of the support that you've given for many years. This is, I think, our fifth report that we've done, and we've always gotten great support. And especially want to um, call out Eric and this uh, Community Preservation Act Committee because they several years ago provided funds that we were able to hire uh, consultants to help us work on this project. It's as you can tell by looking at the, the document online, it's a, it's a huge project. And um, so we really benefited by having the, the funding to be able to do that and um, working a lot with the planning and community development department as well. Um, I'm, I don't, don't really have a whole lot to say. I just appreciate your, your taking the time to, to do this and to prepare a letter that we can submit. We, we've actually, we did submit the draft, the same draft plan that you saw. We submitted that to the state um, office. It's the Division of um, Conservation Services within EOEA. And we've already received back from them conditional approval. Um, we do have some things we have to change, and there's definitely some, some more um, editing that we need to do and um, some wordsmithing and so forth. And um, I'm very happy to, to receive any specific comments that any of you may have about specific issues or topics that are um, addressed in the, in the document. It's a, it's a huge document, and, um, you know, nothing's going to be... So, not everything's going to be perfect, but we would do appreciate any wordsmithing or um, specific comments that any of you may have, and I'm happy to take those offline during the week. I've been away, um, away on vacation, so sorry I wasn't um, available last week. 
but I'm, I'm happy to answer any specific questions you have if I can. And um, otherwise, just thank you all for, for your continued support for this project. Thank you. So I'll turn to my colleagues. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Happy to approve this board issuing a letter of support of the open space and recreation plan that we received. Thank Ms. Arroyo and everyone that worked on this for the amount of work that goes into a document like this is just unbelievable. I would never dare wordsmith the experts. But I would just say, I mean, I've been in Arlington for a long time and I've, um, and I've been in other towns and I think Arlington devotes so m much res of its resources to maintaining and improving their open spaces, their parks, their playing fields. And we don't, we're not swimming in open spaces, but the spaces that we do have for residents, we really take care of the new res is amazing. It's been, we've had a great partnership with the Community Pre Preservation Committee since we've instituted, since we passed the CPA years back. And it's just, Arlington continues to impress with open space and recreation. And I think with this plan, it will continue that. So I look forward to, to what we'll see in the next 10 years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, congratulations, Ms. LaRoyer. That, uh, referring to the uh, CPA sponsored appropriation, I'd say uh, that was money really well spent. This is an outstanding report um, and plan. It is um, it's just full of useful information that helps the community, I think, appreciate its open spaces and really articulates the values that residents um, have consistently held and more recently upheld, I think, in the, in the excellent outreach that you did. I'm very impressed with the extensive uh, scope and quality of the public feedback. You know, a thousand people providing comments on open space plan is just amazing. Um, and, um, and, you know, it's very thoughtful. I think that it gives, you know, it, 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 ultimately, as you explained to us, uh, Back when, in my CPA days, you know, this is a required plan in order to qualify for ongoing grants, and it certainly checks those boxes. But I think it does more than that, and you know, prevent uh, really outlines a vision, a shared vision that w we all have with the community for these uh, precious open spaces. So thank you for that work, and um, also happy to support the letter. And I take it that was a second. That indeed was a second. Thank you, and you know, Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, yeah, thank you, Ms. Leroy, for all the work that you've done on this um, plan, but but many others over the years too. And I was it's nice to see you at the opening of the uh, Reservoir Beach uh, that, that 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 day we bumped into each other. Um, I I think this is very thorough. I, I appreciate the the addition of the CSO references and and Alewife Brook, which is very topical. Um, and, and I, I do know that there are references to the Mugar property. I know this is a care, you have to be careful on this because of the appeals. Um, the only comment I would, I would make, and, and it would probably pass the time that anything can happen, and, and I don't necessarily think it's necessary, but the, the 12 acres beyond what's being proposed for development, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals had very, um, strong language in their in their decision about the need for conservation restriction, the need to preserve that additional 12 acres. And, and let's put aside the opposition that many of us have to the proposed development. I think there is certainly consensus in town on, on that 12 acres. And you have references in the goals to protect uh, property and to monitor real estate um, transactions. But I, I wonder if there's a way, if there is time to incorporate it, it was finding 99 in the in the zba decision about the need for a firm conservation restriction being consistent with the goals that that, that you would have as a, as an open space committee and i do note that the seriousness that the zba took the um the last open space plan in in, in finding 96 they actually referenced the last open space and recreation um plan for the for the town so that's my only comment on that 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 additional area it seems consistent with the need for for conservation purposes and um that, that there's enough language in there recognizing it could be several years on the appeals for the proposed development 
Yes, I, I mean, we, we recognize the difficulty of the timing of the whole um, appeal process and the, and the whole zoning um, review process itself. And I'm, I'd be happy to talk to you offline if that's appropriate to get some proper wording. We, we tried to be very kind of made probably too vague about it because we just weren't sure what we can say. But if you can help us um, articulate that better, I, I think that we would, we would really want to have a much more um, strict um, definition of what, what our goals are in terms of the conservation of that property to the extent that we can, you know, given the legal situation. So I'm happy to talk to you, uh, Mr. DeCorsi, you know, during the week or sometime. Um, I'm sorry I missed your call because I was away, but... Um, no, no, no problem. Yeah, I'd be happy to agree. talk to you this week about that. Thank you. Okay. No, and, and if there are any other, even if they seem like small things for um, any, you know, comments or changes or edits, it, this is not... I have a lot of small edits that are still going to be incorporated. We want to do this as, as soon as possible, but um, I certainly want to get anybody's input on, you know, the Mugar issue and uh, anything else that um, that might have jumped out at you. And and there's definitely time, you know, this week or even to, to next week to to make any final edits. So I, I'll be in touch with you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Leroy. I mean, you answered my question about when you'd like those comments. I mean, and, and so uh, this is really, it's a really good plan. I mean, uh, it's well, very well written, you know, and I'm looking forward to reading it all. I mean, I've only read you know, at this point the sections eight and nine, you know, uh, but I had a glimpse at, at seven, you know, and, and that was compelling in and of itself. Uh, I, what I really like is how you refer to plans that we currently have, in particular Connect Arlington, because I, um, Pat, he, transportation, I won't call myself an expert, but it's the thing that I perhaps know uh, best, uh, uh, and, and uh, the way to integrate youth into uh, the plan, that there are some action plan, some action elements where youth can be much more involved being in our open spaces, and so uh, I can see some hooks into the Young Arlington um, Collaborative. Uh, so, so um, yeah, he, he, the goals, we, there were, were four goals and objectives, we, but the, the actions underneath them were, were really very, uh, very well laid out uh, and, and defined. So, so um, good job, very good job. And, and as I said, I mean, I, I do now, I was going to anyways me read the whole thing, but now I'm going to try to get it done I mean, this week so that if I do have comments, I can get them to you. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, Absolutely. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your um, for your support, and I'll look forward to getting the letter. I guess um, eventually after you approve it. Yes. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, if, if I may, I'd just like to express my personal um, support for Mr. DeCourcy's suggestion on the articulating, um, you know, an appropriate a priority for those twelve acres of the Utah property. I think it's a great idea. All right, uh, so um, on a motion by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. Helmuth to approve the letter of support for open space and recreation plan, Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's a 4-0 vote. Thank you. And so um, if you all don't mind, it, um, it, I would like to pull uh, the discussion with um, town clerk up. A couple not okay so so if miss brazil is is ready you know we can take her now um and uh, so that will be item 15 out of order and uh, authorizing the police details for the state primary um so it's Tom clark hey everyone hi miss brazil how you doing I'm doing well. Good, good. So um, want to tell us any, what you want us to authorize? Yes, um, in the past, um, under uh, state law, the police chief was responsible for organizing the police detail. And so I would always um, just let uh, the police chief know the, the dates and times and locations that we needed. Um, and 
the new law requires a vote of the select board to accomplish the exact same thing. So here I am. Gotcha. So, Mr. Hart, move approval. Second. Mr. Hart? Yeah. Mr. Hart? Oh, no, no. Okay. All right. So, so uh, I'm, I'm fine with that. So, um, uh, uh, when you go fast, I kind of lose them. So, on a motion <laughs> by, by Mr. Hart and a second by Mr. Helmers, you know, Mr. Hart. I'll make one note uh, that I assume is o the board will be okay with. I accidentally wrote that the polls are open on September 6th between 7 and 8 a.m. <laughs> 7 and 8 p.m. So everybody doesn't have to rush in there for one hour. And thank you to Ms. Brazil for um, her, her memo and uh, us getting a chance to talk about it. I, I should also note that the reason this language is a little bit more wordy is because under our town manager act, the town manager essentially directs police and personnel to the police chief. That's why our vote is a little wordier than uh, it might be in some other towns. With that, uh, Mr. Hurd. I'd say it would save us some money on details if it was from the seven day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. It's a unanimous vote. It's four zero vote. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. So we'll go back up now to um, item number 13, discussion mm -hmm. update on overnight permit parking um, pilot. So, um, so I continue to go through the comments. I mean, uh, we've had uh, more comments added. I, mean, uh, uh, I have had a conversation with the chair of TAC, and there will be a meeting with TAC in August I mean, to bounce ideas off of them with respect to uh, how to go about doing uh, the, the pilot. And I was hoping to have that conversation with them uh, in the past meeting, but it wasn't on the agenda partly because he, they had a different notion of what the request was, and that was to try to, whether we should do it or not. And so they were like, well, oh, I mean, that would be a big study. And, and, and they were reluctant to uh, take that on. And also they had a packed agenda, but we are on the agenda. And, this, and if Mr. Corsi wants to join me to bounce ideas off of them, um, of course, you're welcome to do so. Uh, and I have started reviewing parking policies of neighboring um, towns I mean, just to see how they handle the permitting uh, process. I mean, uh, and and um, I've had um, initial conversations with um, Mr. Puller, our town manager, uh, who has offered any assistance that we want you know, in terms of explore, exploring the pilot and whatever may, may come up. Uh, uh, that's my update. I mean, Mr. DeCourcy and I will, I think, meet at least once. I mean, we've had a brief conversation, you know, uh, but I certainly have I mean, some ideas, you know, about what's, how we'll move forward. And I'll just say that I think we should just really focus on the, what are the principles behind us wanting uh, to do the pilot and let that then guide us as to what kind of pilot we do. I know it seems a little circular, but I guess what I'm getting at is like, think metrics, folks, you know, because cause a, a, I'm having a hard time coming up with metrics, you know, and that's partly what I'm gonna be going to, um, uh, bouncing off of, of tack, you know, and, and, and so, uh, but I, I think the inability to come up with metrics should not tell us that we don't do the pilot. It tells us that we, uh, we contemplate change, you know, and, and if there's a rationale behind doing the pilot, you know, that rationale may bear on the fact that we change things and then we determine how we move forward uh, with change. I mean, so, but as I said, think metrics and how you would measure it you know, and how, how if you were to do, if, when we do the pilot, I mean, what would convince you that he, we saw some difference, you know. Uh, so, so, um, so that's it. So I'll, I'll turn to Mr. Corsi if he wants to say something. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I, I, you and I had spoken about uh, receiving input from TAC, and I've done some other, other types of research that I think you and I can uh, talk about before we come back to the board. But I appreciate you reaching out to TAC and, and for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, so that takes care of that issue, uh, uh, we will, well, actually, does anyone want to? Seems like it's in good hands, so I'll look forward to what you guys re report back. 
<clears throat> Thank you. Uh, and uh, next, an update from the Transportation Advisory Committee. So, um, so I am working with the chair and uh, APD, Arlington Police Department, mainly through um, Officer Trotto, uh to see how we can streamline uh, the responses to letters, especially those that involve speeding. You know, and so. Uh, we we're working on that, you know, uh, uh, and I don't want to say anything more right now until I get some more feedback from from Officer uh, Rato. And uh, but I, I think in, it'll work better uh, for everyone. It'll take some of the load off off attack, I mean, uh, uh, and I think also get a faster response I mean, to people who send us letters because I mean, depending on when the letter comes to us, we I mean, will determine when it can get a, even on tax agenda, I mean, and then I mean, it has to, it's in tax queue. I mean, um, and so so um, there may be a way to just kind of go, well, someone can deal with this much faster. You know, and then I think what's really incumbent upon us is to have a way of responding, a, a, a protocol process for responding back I mean, to the person who has written to us. I mean, and, and you'll see that actually in the um, correspondence received. I mean, we have three letters actually from TAC. I mean, and uh, they came to the select board's office, I mean, and I asked um, Ms. Meyer to put it on the agenda so that we could see it, you know, and, and read it. And um, I think they're good. They're, they're very well done. I mean, uh, they, were, they were built copy to and say first on whack at these, and, and I think he did a really good job. And now I think he, we'll figure out how to get them, you know, to the people who initially sent us the letters. It's not going to be hard. We can just find it. But, but just make that part of the process that kind of closes the loop with um, respect to the person sending us the letter, tack, looking at it, giving me you know, a response, I mean, and, and then responding back, and then f figuring out a way to make it such that we can easily search uh, if we are asked again uh, about it. So, so, uh, so that's, that's it uh, pretty much for my uh, report from TAC. That kind of teased a little bit the, the letters you know, and the correspondence received, and, and we can touch on that later on. And so any questions, comments, concerns? Yes, Mr. Um, Just a thank you for that. I, I'm really grateful for your leadership um, as Mr. Chair. I think that I was really, you know, in my year plus a couple of months on the board, I think I have heard more from the general public about traffic safety um, than any other issue. Um, you know, I mean, it, there's, it's, um, and that, that was kind of a surprise to me, but it just shows how important I think that, that is to people and even just, just people and friends and neighbors talking to me. Um, so, you know, I think that we're all aware that, you know, we, the TAC does a, works incredibly difficult and they volunteer uh, with, with considerable skills and we're fortunate to have them. Uh, but I'm glad that you're thinking of ways to triage and prioritize things, particularly with, for, you know, for safety and also to get responses to the public. So uh, this is all really good news and I'm glad for the update. Well, thank you. Welcome. I'll try to make the updates. I mean, regular, I mean, you know, we have TAC meeting once a month, but it'll depend on the agenda and certainly I can chop back on how much I talk, you know, so, um, alrighty, you know, so um, we'll move on now to um, item 16, uh, draft uh, a discussion and potential approval of uh, the draft joint letter from the Arlington boards and commissions uh, regarding Alewife Brook Upper Mystic Combined Sewer Overflow Long-Term Control Plan. And, and so um, Mr. Heim had put this in on the agenda and at the time he didn't realize that Vice Chairman Heim wasn't going to be here. Uh, I had reached out to uh, Vice Chairman Heim to find out if she wanted anything on the agenda postponed. I, I haven't heard back, you know, but I, I'm suggesting that we at least have a preliminary discussion you know, so that at least we can kind of air things out a little bit you know, and, and maybe do a, a tentative approvals just in case if things have to move faster than we think. But Mr. Heim can lay out the, what the probability of that is you know, and maybe we'll just wait until Mrs. Mahan um, returns I mean, before, before we vote. But, uh, so I'll turn it over now to Mr. Heim. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, the board has been talking about this issue a little bit here and there uh, for a little while. Um, the actual overall posture of this is a little complicated and hard to explain uh, succinctly, but um, 
I'll take some shortcuts. The MWRI, Cambridge and Somerville, all discharge a certain amount of what's called um, combined sewer outfall or overflow CSOs into the Alewife Brook. They're in the middle, uh, I'm sorry, not in the middle. They're the very beginning stages of what's called the variance process under Mass Department of Environmental Protection uh, water quality regulations and a larger NIPDES permit uh, that's administered by the EPA. The stage that they're at now is developing a scope of work for what will be the long-term control plan that will be subject to more formal hearings later on administered by Mass DEP and the EPA. This letter is essentially aimed at reinforcing what a lot of our local Arlington advocacy organizations ranging from Save the Elwife Brook to Mr. River Watershed Association and some of our town officials have been saying at these initial meetings. I will say that the MWRA, Cambridge and Somerville have all made these meetings public. They have been responsive to both advocates and the EPA's call to continue to make them public such that early feedback is received rather than developing a scope of work, developing a long-term control, control plan, and then getting a lot of feedback on it at a stage where it's kind of like the train has already left the station and it's hard to change directions. Um, that being said, uh, there's been a lot of things that uh, um, some advocates have been uh, disappointed with so far, um, some long-term frustrations about the condition of the Airwife Brook. Overall, we all know that the MWRA in particular, uh, as well as Cambridge and Somerville, have uh, invested a huge amount of money in trying to clean up the greater watersheds of the Boston area, the greatest success being in Boston Harbor, which is part of why the MWRA was formed. Um, but um, a lot of the feedback from Arlington has been that the Airwife Brook has not been uh, remedied. Uh, sufficiently and that there would like to be a more aggressive development of alternatives to uh, mitigating and controlling those CSOs. Some people have articulated as closing the CSOs, other people have said it differently. What I've tried to outline here is essentially support for what the EPA has already been responsive to, which is continued commitment to public meetings at early stages. And again, the good news is that MWRA, Somerville, and Cambridge have all done that. Um, commitment to revise modeling. This is probably one of the most important things that I've heard in these meetings when I've attended them, which is that the MWRA and to a lesser extent our municipal neighbors have been sort of advancing modeling data that talks about the average year based on this very long look backward. But the issue that we're facing in more recent years may be fewer CSO events but with much higher volumes because of the intensity of uh, severe storms and the frequency of severe storms. It's kind of weird, it's like fewer overall discharges, but the discharges that are coming are huge. Um, so that's another focus. Another piece is trying to reinforce that Arlington is committing resources um, through its DPW primarily, uh, but also through its um, Environmental Planner and Conservation Commission and planning efforts to reduce other sources of pollution into the Elwife Brook. It's not just CSOs that, produce, that pollute the Elwife Brook, it's also um, other types of runoff. But we've been doing a lot of those things. I don't want to overemphasize this point, but it was sort of suggested at the most recent public meeting that, you know, Arlington doesn't have a seat at the table because Arlington, A, isn't subject to uh, the regulatory authority, which is true. We're not the variance holder or the NIFTES permit holder with respect to these discharges, but also that we're not paying for them. But the reality is, is that Arlington is doing what it can um, to devote finan significant financial resources to trying to uh, improve the water quality of the LA Brook. So I've tried to highlight just a few of those things and then a few other things that if we're once going to detail we can about things that, again, the EPA has largely been responsive to already and that the select board if the Conservation Commission would like to join this letter, they don't have to. Um, the ARB, they don't have to, but if they'd like to join this letter, could sort of be one, I want to call it a pre-comment letter because we're not yet to the hearing phase. We're early on in the process, but early on in the process, it may be the best opportunity that we have 
to say, please commit the financial resources to um, addressing problems in the alewife brook. I don't want to, by the way, take credit for the excellent work of uh, other town officials and advocacy organizations or the Environmental Protection Agency who has been terrific in this process. I just want to, the, the purpose of this was to try to reemphasize things that are going in a positive direction without the board necessarily having to all be um, hyper informed of the nuances and intricacies of NIPTES permitting. Sorry, that was a little longer than I had hoped, but I hope that's clear. And by the way, I'm sorry, there's a few typos in it. I apologize. I'll definitely clean those up. This is meant to be a sort of preliminary uh, discussion just so we can sort of get going. So, so I'll just ask a quick question. I mean, so when would be the ideal time to get this letter? Mr. Chair, there's no uh, specific deadline other than that in December, the scope of work for these long-term control plans is due to in revised form to the EPA. So I think we want to try to get in sooner rather than later to keep sort of asserting Arlington's position on this um, while the EPA, Cam the MWRA, Cambridge and Somerville are all talking and tweaking what they think they can do, what they think they can't do, how much it'll cost. We want them to develop alternatives and to sort of cost out, you know, what can be done. So I think you want to do this as soon as reasonably possible without rushing unnecessarily. Well, I asked that question because I thought it might influence the motion that anyone might, might make. So and I'll sit back and ask Mr. Helmut. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Heim, uh, for the excellent memo and the excellent summary thereof. Um, I, would like to, I would like to move that we approve the letter. Um, I mean, it's always ideal to do this with full five members, although I think my understanding of our, our uh, Ms. Mahan's position is that I think she'd support you know, everything that, that's on it. She's been a real, really effective advocate. Um, and my reasoning is just, I think, that if, you know, because Arlington has an opportunity, if we get out in front of this and do this as, as quickly as we can, if, if, my, you know, if, we, if we feel confident, you know, that, uh, knowing how, how slowly government can work sometimes at the federal level, uh, having this in early out the gate might, might be an advantage. So um, that would be my motion. Thanks. So thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll second Mr. Helmuth's um, motion and um, thank Attorney Heim for the work that he did on the letter and, and, and the tone of the letter, which I think is really captures uh, you know, concern, um, recognizing the work that's been done, but, but also the need for, for, for change here at, uh, to, to change with circumstances that we've uh, found at the Alewife Brook the past couple of years. Um, the other thing I would say, I appreciate it. I, I think it's appropriate for the Conservation Commission to be asked to sign. I'm not sure on this issue. It seems to me that the Select Board and Conservation Commission might be the two appropriate uh, boards to sign, not to exclude the Redevelopment Board, but it feels more uh, Executive and, and Conservation Commission. And just a comment, I don't think it's maybe for us to think down the road. I, I do think the continued need for federal funding is, is also something that's, that's going to be necessary because as we've said before our neighbors in Cambridge and Solville I think realize there's a problem here but that the, the, the cost of um, the solution is, is probably beyond their their means but but certainly something that we should be continue to reach out to our federal delegation and and uh, as a as a region thank you no? I'm happy to support it um, thank attorney Heim for his work on this I think it really encapsulates a number of discussions that we've had, and I think, and I am sure, the board is all in agreement as to what our position is here, and I think this is a good step in the right direction. So, I have a question for Mr. Heim. So, can we vote to approve this, but then wait until Mrs. Mahan has a book, and, and then, and then, and then, if she wants to change something, it, I guess it would probably be appropriate to come back to the board unless it's minor. I mean, I'm trying to get a range of, of like, I mean, how we can include her in the process and what kind of flexibility we can give um, without coming back uh, to the next meeting in case there's a desire to really move forward. Because our next meeting is in, in 
August 22nd. Yeah. I think if the, Mr. Chair, thank you. I think if the, if the board uh, votes to authorize the chair to transmit this letter with any additional con uh, comments by Mrs. Mahan, that should cover it. And then we'll have to see whether the Conservation Commission substantially agrees with this and wants to sign on. And they may have some feedback that's worthy of coming back to the board, or they may just say, great, we'll sign on to it. To, to, to it too. So I guess I would look for a motion that says uh, move approval uh, to authorize the chair to um, transmit a letter of initial comment um, with the Conservation Commission subject to any additional comments that Ms. Mahan uh, may add to it. Great. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'd be happy to amend my motion um, there too. Great. Thank you. And, uh, Second. Thank you. So, so thanks. And, and I, so, so I, I was at the, the last meeting and I think I had a conversation with you regarding you know, what I, I, I think it might have been the representative from Somerville eh, who said eh, that um, uh, Arlington can have input you know, when, they, when they put up, put up some money. Eh, and and um, it, I, I got where he was coming from on that because cause essentially what he was saying was that he Right, this format I mean is where I mean, we get to make the input, I mean, and 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 that Cambridge and Somerville I mean then have I guess other discussions I mean, with MWRA and, and EPA or whatever other entities I mean, and that I mean, we weren't going to be included in those, you know, and and I, we still aren't going to be, as far as I understand, correct, Mr. Heim? That's correct, Mr. Chair. And, and I, I don't think the tone, I hope the tone of this doesn't reflect a sort of snappy, sort of like comeback as much as to say, we are investing resources. Yeah. If you'd like to know more about those resources and what we're trying to do, we'd be happy to contribute that to this overall discussion. Yeah, yeah. And, and I hear you, except that it does kind of reference that, that, that me, that me. And so, um, I mean, I'm fine. I'm not, I'm not going to say, uh, change anything, me, but, but, um, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Chair, yeah. now is the time. If you'd like to make any amendments to it, that's well within your right. <laughs> I'll think about it. But, but I, 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 see the, I see the point that you're trying to make. You know? um, so, um, I'm not proud about wordsmithing, Mr. Chair. You can, you can uh, <laughs> I'd be receptive to that. If you want to take a vote and you would like to maybe tweak it with me, if your colleagues are okay with that, I'd be happy to uh, revisit that specific uh, few sentences with you, sir. Yeah, it's just okay. Well, I'll think about it because yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not hung up on my words either. So so we'll, we'll maybe have a little quick phone call. So, so so you phrased that motion so well, you know. So uh, on the on the motion to uh, uh, approve the the letter, I mean for transmission transmission to the conservation commission uh, uh, with potential input, I mean from Mrs. Bahan, you know by Mr. Helmuth and a second by Mr. Corsi, Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's a four zero vote. Thank you. So um, we move now to discussion and vote town hall banner policy. And so, so towards the, I guess it was January, you know, Mr. Hurd and I, um, um, volunteered, you know, to take on the task of updating in the town hall banner policy in you know, the select board handbook, you know, so I, um, I sent it to um, Mr. Hurd. Things come up like articles in the warrant, like the warrant comes up and then our attention has to focus on that and then we have town meeting and, and here we are, I mean, and so just kind of want to wrap this up kind of you know um, as much as this issue will get wrapped up in in one meeting you know so so um i um there are two versions here i mean which is substantially the same just uh it's, it's just that i mean where the note I mean comes in and the note regarding the primary purpose of the update in one version it's at the very top I mean, and and another version uh it's not highlighted as a note it just kind of says you know the the primary purpose of the update but with respect to the the meat of it you know uh, I mean essentially it, it is saying that there will be no banners on town hall uh and any banners on things such as the 
light poles made out of uh, uh, they, the requests come in through the uh, committee or com commission you know, in that uh, we essentially uh, approve that request. He, so that's what I have to say on it. He, and I'll, I'll turn to my colleague, Mr. Hurd, and then we'll go to Mr. Heim you know, for some legal updates. Yeah. Yes, um, I would just add that thanks to the chair, the extent of my participation was that the chair came up with the new language, sent it to me, and I said it looks good. <laughs> so, um, but I, we had a we had initial conversations about what the language would be and where our heads were, and we're in, I think, unanimous between the two of us agreement as to what the policy would be, and I think it, it's correctly reflected here. And uh, you know, we had this was referenced earlier in the meeting, but. Part of the reason we had put this off back way back when, when I think initially Mr. DeCourcy and Mr. Kiro were taking, undertaking this was the Supreme Court decision, which I'm sure Attorney Heim will talk about, has now been resolved that in essence says that if we put up one statement, we can't regulate what other statements that people request to be put on town hall. and the ramifications of such a of such a decision by the Supreme Court could be very dramatic unless we institute a policy like this so I think this is this isn't as much as people are going to say this is specific to one banner one issue this is just that we've as recently as our last town town day committee meeting have had to have, have a discussion and change a policy regarding town day where we said that you know likely by the time we get to town day we'll have a policy in place that won't allow for one of the sponsors to put a banner on town hall and they were disappointed but understood the rationale for it so i mean it's not for one banner it's not for just political banners it's for all banners it's and i mean we've had there was a town meeting vote but we've also heard from many, many residents, and I think the general scope of the, that I hear from residents is that they just don't want to hang banners on town hall, and there was never really a firm policy that I know of or that was enforced regarding this. So I think this is the direction that we should be going in, and again, I thank the chair for his leadership and work on this. So. I just heard, yeah, so. Um. So like I said, I'll go to Mr. Heim next, you know, uh, if you want to say something. But. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the only, I guess, pieces that I, I would want folks to understand is that what we're really talking about are two sort of concepts under First Amendment law. Whether or not town hall should be a limited public forum in which private speech is expressed. In other words, if you're going to have people apply to put a certain um, flag or banner or message on town hall, there have to be content neutral regulations that govern what that is because you can't allow speech that you like and disallow speech that you don't like. The only exception to that is the so-called government speech doctrine. Now, the shirtlift case, which is what um, we were sort of waiting on, ultimately held that the city of Boston um, wasn't really engaging in government speech when they were using the flagpoles outside City Hall to put up different flags, and then they refused to put up a Christian flag, um, which was what started the suit. There are certain circumstances in which government speech would still be allowed, and the Supreme Court decision does talk about that. But um, that wasn't the case of what was happening uh, with respect to the city of Boston's flagpoles, uh, which is part of what we had previously based our policies upon. The other thing I guess I want to emphasize is that um, this doesn't affect traditional public forums. People can gather on street corners, they can gather out on the steps of town hall, engage in political expression and conduct 
um, that's contemplated by the First Amendment. Uh, the real question about town hall and banners and the light poles is whether or not we're creating a limited public forum by uh, allowing uh, speech under content neutral. We don't have to know what it says in order to know whether it's approved or not. Finally, um, with respect to the sort of designation of committees and commissions to put activities and events uh, before you for approval, I do want to make clear that you're vesting some ability for those committees and commissions to make uh, certain judgments about how they're going to decide what they're going to basically say goes on those light poles as an activity or event. So there may be some further thought that needs to be um, had within those specific committees and commissions about how they will evaluate an application by the Arlington International Film Festival or an Arlington cult, uh, Arts and Culture um, Commission um, activity or event. Um, so th th there's, there's, what you've crafted is a, a policy that's very uh, sort of devolution, if you will, that allows um, other government bodies in Arlington to make a decision about what is an activity or an event that they'd like to promote. Um, and your role will really be in making sure that these very content neutral four criteria are applied evenly to whatever comes in front of you. If you have any questions, this is a very complicated area of the law. I want to make it clear that there's no absolute um, perfect answer to these questions. There never, there never has been and there never will be. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to try to be as best service as I can. Thank you. Thank you. So, open it. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for your work, uh, colleagues, and Mr. Heim for your remarks. Uh, a couple of questions. So, um, does the policy that's presented here is recommended that we vote on? In your mind, just to, just to be clear, is that government speech or a limited public forum for the light poles? Well, the policy that you've put, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman? Please, please, please. The, let me pull it up. The policy that you've put um, for tonight's discussion essentially um, says that town hall is not going to be used as a limited right. public forum. So that's. So that takes it off the table. That's off the table. Yeah. Banners on light poles have to come at the request of an officially recognized town commission, town board committee or commission to promote an activity or sponsored by that board, committee and commission for a specific and limited period of time. Mm -hmm. So a committee and commission could sponsor lots of different things and that might be um, government speech in some, in some contexts mm -hmm. or in other contexts it might be that they have a facially neutral set of things that they want to do, like the art contests mm. um, that we had in previous years, mm -hmm. um, where uh, the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture had a mm -hmm. sort of specific activity for a limited period of time, um, and they s had a criteria for selecting winners that was not based on the substantive content mm -hmm. of those submissions. So you do have some latitude and flexibility, mm -hmm. uh, but you are giving um, some discretion to, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, subordinate or inferior bodies. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so as a follow-up to that, under Sherliff or any other relevant uh, precedents and, and decisions, um, are you comfortable that the policy as it regards to the, the light poles, you know, would uh, s preserve the town's power to disallow messages that we wanted to disallow? I think that uh, it's in the application, Mr. Hellman. Mr. I'm sorry, may I yeah, please, please. I think it's in the uh, application. So if you have uh, an art contest or you have some activity by a border commission mm -hmm. 
that eventually it essentially creates that uses the light poles as a limited public forum, mm -hmm. um, then uh, you can't disallow mm -hmm. things. The, the committee or commission responsible that activity can't disallow things based on disagreement. Yeah. Just to be clear, I mean, I, I, there's yeah. no, again, there's no perfect solution to all these Good. problems. Yeah. If they're going to engage in government speech, it's limited to an activity or an event as described by this policy. So, and for a specific and limited period of time. Mm -hmm. So one thing that strikes, that comes to mind is that for example, for Black History Month, I recall uh, the banners up and down mm -hmm. Massachusetts Avenue highlighting um, different important figures in um, American history. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Certainly, a town border body could sponsor an event for Black History Month that would mm -hmm. essentially put those uh, banners up. And they might just design them themselves. And if they build a record, that might be sufficient for government speech, mm -hmm. um, which is not the same as someone saying, uh, Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture, I want to have an event. Uh, entitled, you know, an, o an ode to, you know, the Confederate South. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to celebrate Confederate war generals and stuff like that. Well, first of all, um, that's not something that's likely to be sponsored by, um, mm -hmm. by an Arlington committee or commission. Mm -hmm. uh, but second of all, to the extent that they're asking the government to engage in speech, we do have some ability to build a record that says yes or no, this is not mm -hmm. um, consistent with mm -hmm. um, this border body's uh, work and mission. Um, again, it's a little easier if committees and commissions keep things strictly limited to here's an activity or event, mm -hmm. we're creating a sort of limited public forum, we want to have an art contest, mm -hmm. that's what we're using yeah. it for, well. um, or we want to promote Arlington arts and artists. Mm -hmm. yep. We want people to put up banners, but you might get a banner that, you know, yeah, no, I got it. Is, mm -hmm. is, is, is presenting something that, that you might have to make sure that there's reasonable mm -hmm. uh, rules, if you will, mm -hmm. for that specific solicitation. Thank you. Um, tangential to that, um, in the best sense of it being kind of relevant, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so can we, I mean, I, I think if you I, I take it that you're comfortable with this, but I think kind of a, a related thing is that, you know, if, if saying that this has to come through sort of a pipeline of an official town board commission committee, you know, body, um, that if we then say that you, that we would not entertain suggestions from private citizens, you know, who, who want to go outside of that process, that we're still within the bounds of current legal President. Yes. So I, I thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a good question. So if you wanted to, if, if the interpretation of this and maybe a tweaking of it is that it has to essentially be something that is voted upon mm -hmm. to be approved by a committee or commission. Um, I think that's sort of already kind of contemplated here. I mean, yeah. You can't control everything. I mean, f for all you know, somebody writes a letter and says, I want to have, you know, banners promoting an activity about something controversial, I don't know. Um, and a board or a committee says, yeah, we, 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 wanna, we wanna do that, um, and they vote to do it. But again, what's, what's good about that is from a government speech perspective, you've got a record. Mm -hmm. um, what Boston did not have at all was a record. Um, and alternatively, if committees and commissions wanna say, we really mean you know, activities. We don't, we don't really mean just general, you know, events. We want it to be, there's a date that this is gonna happen. Um, like, again, I keep bringing up Arlington International Film Festival, I don't know why, it's just stuck in my head. But that's an example of something that, that if, if, you know, the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture wants to be oriented towards making choices about what cultural events they're gonna, uh, support, or not support, but advertise, um, they can do that more as a 
limited public forum than is government speech. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and I just have some more. Oh, <laughs> I'm just, please, just going to go no, for it. Um, this is an important discussion. Yeah. Um, is there anything, the, the exclusion of banners from town hall, which I'm going to comment on separately, because I would still like to be able to do them just myself. Um, but would, it, would this current policy, if voted, uh, preclude using the, color, the colored lights in town hall in a pride configuration or, you know, any other configuration that might be understood, commonly understood, to be a statement? And I should have, I, I'm springing this on you, so, so I know that that might be a complicated question. It's okay if you say you're not sure. Um, so your policy says displays of banners, informational or otherwise. So it's talking very specifically about a kind of sign. It's not talking about lights. Um, I, do want, I do owe a duty of sort of candor to the board. If you're using lights to convey a certain... I personally don't feel like displaying rainbow colors is, or, or the pride flag is political from my personal point of view, but from, as a lawyer, I will say that, that somebody is going to interpret that as political or could interpret that as political. It's not that, it's not a bright line. We don't get to say certain things are political and certain things aren't under the law, yeah. even if we feel like they might be from a moral or ethical standpoint. I think to so, me the question is, is not is it political, but is it a banner? Sure. So I, I guess my, the, the candor that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ex express to you is that there's obviously a limited configuration of things you can do with lights. The board has to decide whether or not it wants town hall to this policy to extend to illuminations. You know, if you want to illuminate town hall in blue and yellow in support of uh, the people of Ukraine, um, are you open to? Are you open to? Somebody saying, well, I want this other light scheme in support of Russia. Right. Yeah. And Russian right. interests. I'm just saying that the yep. same questions are going to come up yep. totally. no matter what you do with respect to any type of display that's meant to convey a message. And that's, that's the piece that I'm trying to be candid with the board about. Thank you. I very much appreciate that. And thank you to my colleagues for your patience. I'll just say for myself, uh, first of all, I appreciate the work that went into this. I completely respect points of view of my colleagues, even if they're different than mine. Um, I want to hear what my colleague, other colleague, Mr. Katorsi and Mr. Diggins have to say before I decide for sure how I vote, would vote on this. Um, I would like to find a way to preserve our ability to use town hall for, for banners as government speech as, a, as approved by this body, um, realizing that that, in, that is complicated. Um, so. Um, so I'm not sure how that would affect my vote on this, but I feel like I've said plenty now and I want to hear from other folks. And, and, and I'll also say that we don't have to vote on it tonight, you know, so we can have a discussion if we want to wait, and that's fine too, you know, so. Uh, I saw Mr. Pillow over there. So I'm going to do what no lawyer should do and say something before he's talked to his lawyer about it. Um, but I will anyway. Um, It'd be my interpretation as manager, if this were to pass, that I would not see it as applying to lights and I would see lights as being indicative of government speech. There are certain events, Pride Month being one of them, Black History Month, that have been declared months. Now, I don't know who has made those declarations and what the, the line is between whether just a bunch of people have come around and said, okay, this is Black History Month, or whether in fact the state or the federal government has made those determinations. Um, but I don't think it's inconsistent with the town's ability to make statements about those things because I think those are recognized, governmentally recognized um, events. Um, my reading of this would be that this does not apply to lights, but it's a question that I asked Doug about 25 minutes ago, and we did not have a chance to discuss it. So I think you know it's an open, you know it's it's a very good question, um, and um, you know whether there are other things like you know Ukraine. Well, is that a re recognized issue? I guess the extent to which our federal government has taken a stand in support of the Ukrainians. Um, 
I would say that would be consistent with federal government speech and f consistent with what the town could say. Um, the, you, you, you're going to slice salami on this forever, and there's no there's, there, as Doug said, there are no clear lines in the First Amendment on these things. Um, but that's how I would interpret it as manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, and I appreciate you um, bringing this before us. I mean, it's, it's, as I've said, when we've had the discussions going back to 2021, earlier this year, this is a, a very complicated issue in terms of the government speech doctrine and when we choose to engage in government speech. And we just heard from, from Mr. Mr. Pooler, and, and there may be, as we think about this in terms of who makes the decision to turn the lights on, whether and, and whether it's it's with the approval of the board. And there are some communities across the country that now do have light um, policies, and and, and it, it is difficult. You're, you're slicing the onion, and and um, I just I, I think as we've if, if we've talked about this, and and I, I think part of the discussion is if we choose to engage in government speech, where are we going to do it and how are we going to do it? And I, and I think, you know, what you've said here and what's come out of comments from several of our colleagues, it, 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 uh, you, Mr. Diggins, Mr. Hurd, Mrs. Mahan, is, is that the facade of town hall is not a place that you want to have a banner up for, for, for speech. And if you're not, you don't have standards, you're not controlling the speech that's on town hall. Um, and then there were questions, well, if we did want to engage in government speech, is there a place in town that we we would want to do it other than town hall? And then that, that raises the issue of the light. So the shirtlift decision came out on May 2nd. Um, and and I understand what you're doing here. For me personally, I'd, I'd like a little time to, to digest this in terms of the overall, like what standards are we going to apply um, if to, for lighting? We, would we use a different place in town and to engage in government speech? If we engaged in government speech, how would we do that? And what standards would we have? I totally understand what you're doing with the facade here. And I think, I think you know, over time, there, there may be a consensus that has developed on, on that based on the shirtlift decision, based on just the difficulties that we have in terms of, of, of developing standards and, and controlling the message. Um, I'm just not at a point where just seeing this and understanding these other concerns where um, I'm ready to vote vote on this to the exclusion of other things because I think I think it goes beyond just just uh, adding a few words here um, and and um, so that's where I am right now uh, on this but I appreciate bringing it, bringing it up but I, I need a little time to think I want to talk to attorney I am about a few concerns that I have just in different context in the overall government speech context. Great, no problem. The, the point is to, to um, get this thing back in, in front of us so that we can we wrap it up to the extent that this kind of issue gets wrapped up at least, make a quantum move you know, on it. You know? And so for me, the, the lights mean is, is a gap. You know? And so I feel that we would need to address lights being separately. I mean, it can be under this this policy, you know, but then there'd be like another paragraph or whatever to address lights specifically, you know, and, 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 and you can probably guess where I'm going with the lights, you know, and so, so, so it'd be like, well, I, I wouldn't have any uh, display of lights that are conveying any kind of message, you know, if I were to do something with lights, it'd probably be you know, the town colors, you know. And, 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 and that would be it, you know, and maybe some kind of pattern with them. I mean, maybe, I mean, uh, red, white, and blue on, on a July 4th, Veterans Day, a Memorial Day, uh, just to just kind of neutralize the lights on Town Hall. You know, as Mr. DeCourcy said, I mean, the part of the discussion is where, I'm not trying to stop, you know, uh, people from, Either us as a board, I mean, or entities in town, I mean, from taking positions I mean, on important matters. You know, uh, as I said, we can do that on the light poles. We can maybe find I mean, some places in town, I mean, across streets, or whatever, and with the understanding that that we we may be in positions depending on on 
policy or, or the nature of the speech mean where we will have to have the messages up there that the community at large don't, doesn't like. You know, uh, but as one person who sent us an email, that would probably, that would be a learning experience. You know, uh, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm not afraid of that. I mean, it would it would be yeah, I mean, it would be something we'd have to just deal with as a community. You know, uh, so so um, so uh, there's probably nothing else that I would say that I haven't said uh, repeatedly. So I'm just going to uh, leave it at that. You know, and so we've had. Uh, preliminary discussion, and uh, I think I mean, probably if there were going to be a motion, it would be the table till, uh, till later, but I don't even know if that's necessary. And so, um, well, to be continued? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, we will move on to correspondence received. And, uh, so, we have 618 discouraging use of helium balloons at Town Day by Mr. Grant Cook, and uh, 19 is concerns regarding 40B project located at 1021-1025 Massachusetts Avenue, Patricia Barron Warden, uh, and third, uh, safety concerns in the Dallas School area, Peter Fuller, and last, we have um, recommendations from the Transportation Advisory Commission. Uh, so, um, Take a motion. Second. Okay. And what I will, um, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that we um, send 20 and, um, to TAC, and then I'll have a conversation with the chair. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll contact him. Um, uh, Ms. Meyer about that before the, the letter goes out. And, and as I pointed out in my rec in my update from TAC, I mean, these are, 21 is the recommendations, I mean, and, and we'll figure out, we'll get those to the, the parties that um, are, that we're responding to um, in the recommendations. And, and um, for um, 18, I kind of referred to an issue around town day, and so, um, We'll, we'll send that to the town day committee. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the town day committee already addressed this, and yeah. the, the chair, if you haven't already, is going to respond to Mr. Cook. So, yeah. yeah. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, so, so I mean, essentially, we, you know, it's, it's um, it's something that we will deal with me in the next town day, you know, and and as far as this current town day, I mean, as um. Mr. Cook said to me, it's more about encouraging people not to use them. And so, so if anyone you know, applies for it, we'll have a gentle little conversation. So, so, um, so um, with that, um, any other comments? Yeah. So, uh, so we have a motion by <clears throat> Mr. Helmets and a second by Mr. Hurd and, uh, and Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's a 4 0 vote. Thank you. And next we go to new business. Uh, Ms. Meyer? No new business. Mr. Heim? No new business. And before I go to uh, Mr. Pooler, I just want to say welcome to uh, yes. your <laughs> first select board meeting. You caught me a little bit off guard because I thought you weren't going to be here. Uh, until August, I mean, so so I had a little something kind of you know prepared for that. Nothing spectacular, but just you know, uh, <laughs> it was going to be you know, uh, uh, a little more of an introduction. I mean, with uh, some explanation to to uh, our our fellow residents. I mean, about the, the position and and the extent of it. But we'll save that for for August. But delighted to have you here. You know, uh, in in your sand colored. Suit, Mr. Fuller. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if, uh, thank, any thank, words? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm delighted to be here, um, and I look forward to many other meetings with you all and working with you. Um, I am glad to be wearing a summer suit. They're hard to find, um, but uh, given the, the weather and the climate issues that uh, are affecting us, it seems appropriate. Um, so, thank you. 
Welcome. Yeah. So I have no new business. Okay. Mrs. Corsi? Uh, no new business. Uh, Mr. Hurt? No new business. Hello? Good to see you in the chair, Mr. Pulley. No new business. And, and, uh, so I, um, I guess I have one piece of new business, and I thought actually someone else was going to cover it last month. But, uh, maybe you can help me out with this, Mr. Mr. Pooler. Apparently, Mrs. Ms. Barnjourno uh, has received an award, a heroin award for her work I mean, on, uh, on the pandemic. I mean, and it seems like it's a big deal. It, um, it certainly, it, um, um, can you, can, I, I haven't pulled up the, the press release. I mean, can, but are you able to expand on it a little bit now? Or Certainly, yeah, Mr. Sure. Chair. Right. Um, Christine Brangerno, our Director of Health and Human Services, uh, was recognized as one of the heroines of the Commonwealth. She was sponsored in this uh, recognition by Senator um, Cindy Freeman. Right. And um, there are, or she wasn't the only one in the state who received this recognition, but it is a special call out to her for the work that she did in the town around the COVID pandemic, around making sure that uh, we were safe there, um, that in addition with her work to making sure that people were getting fed in town, um, she was certainly in involved in that. Um, and there was one other item issue that if I'd known you were going to ask me, yeah, I would I'm have sorry. remembered. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. But there was a third that got special recognition. It's, it is in the press release. It is on the town website. Uh, and I would just add, um, Arlington, I think, has been way ahead of many other communities in its uh, health work. And that is really because of uh, Christine. Uh, we are very lucky to have her. Uh, I know personally working with her on a daily basis, she's always full of good information and a an an unwavering commitment to protect public health. So, a well deserved honor for her. Yes, and, uh, you know, and I, I think she has more work ahead. You know, so so and so it's good that we do have someone like her. You know, still with us and you know, leading us um, hopefully in in um, the right direction. So, um, with that, take the motion to. Adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay, so I motion to adjourn by Mr. DeCourcy and a second by Mr. Elvis. Mr. Heard. We almost yes. made it. Almost made it. <laughs> almost <laughs> made it. <laughs> so, 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 uh, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Heard. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's a 4 0 vote.